Um, I, I'm not sure if veterans with our perspective is necessarily unique. Um, there are a lot of vets like us who, who learned the reality of war and either do not support what's going on or are actively engaged in trying to stop it. But as you know, uh, and as, as we found out many times, there are many veterans out there, many Vietnam veterans, for example, who are adamantly opposed to what we do, who are adamantly opposed to, to, to people who are interested in peace and ending the war, very strong advocates of the war. Now, to, to, to us, um, it's sad, and it's always embarrassing, but I think we can understand um, what motivates them in a way. Experiencing war and dealing with the aftermath of war is difficult enough when you believe or you hope that what you did was important and necessary and, 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 and was in behalf of a just and noble cause. That many people clutch to that in order to have some semblance of normalcy in their life to try and go on. Um, family members of individuals who were killed in war um, find some comfort in the thought that my son or my daughter died for freedom and for justice and for the American way. To, to accept the, um, the reality that this is all for nothing that this is futile, it's wrong, it's immoral, that it's a waste, may be so overwhelming to people that they just cannot face the reality of it. And given the alternative, given the choice, they choose to live in the mythology rather than the reality. And we have to respect that, especially those of us who, who have been dealing with the consequences of war all these years. We have to respect that. I mean, we try to reason with these people that they understand. And, um, and as far as I'm concerned, no true healing from war can occur until one accepts what it is that we did. You can't heal thinking that you are on a noble mission. Because you're dealing with fantasy rather than reality. And in order to heal, you have to heal from reality. So, so, we try, we try, and um, we try to educate not only other veterans, but um, the general public as well about the realities of war, and we hope that people can finally understand and make better decisions. Also, when I was there, I refused to do any work for the military. I was just like that, on strike, and, and about a third of my company a lot of people want to refuse to work, refuse to do anything. Um, <laughs> no, you know, they, 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 they did and they didn't. They, they basically didn't want to. A lot of guys refused to go out to the, to, to go, to go, to, to, you know, direct orders to go down, like one of my friends, down the path. They saw all, they saw all kinds of, this happened many times in the infantry, where you go down that path, they refused to go, and they flew all kinds of generals, threatened them with the you know, court martial, this and that. They ended up, they took them back to the rear, and a couple of days later, they went back out. They didn't want, they had so many cases of people refusing direct orders, and, 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 and in the end, they couldn't, they, the military was not done. It was a mutiny. It was, it was basically, it ended up a mutiny in Vietnam. That's why they basically, one of the reasons why they had it. But, By that time, the military was broken, like it is now. It's not 68, right after Ted, 69. It was really broken. By the time I got into 1969 to 73, there was uh, rampant drug abuse going on. Oh, yeah. uh, there were desertions going on all over the place. Heroin all over Vietnam. Uh, there were race riots going on on yes. military bases on the ships in San Diego and North uh, The black soldiers and sailors were. Uh, Lashing out, you know, men and their rights. Right after Dr. King was assassinated, mm -hmm. and, 
And uh, <clears throat> myself, when I came back, I became very outspoken. And I, mean, I, I paid dearly for that. I was shunned by my uh, shipmates. I was referred to as a communist, coward, traitor. I was given demeaning jobs to do. I mean, uh, and threatened with court martial. You know, and that day we joined the, uh, the National Service Union. Uh, there was an attempt to unionize the armed services back, I think, in '71 or '72. And again, under threat of court martial, I was ordered to cease and desist. Was, you know, designed for that. Well, I bet, uh, it took a lot of courage. I must say, that, yeah. But I, they, uh, my my company commander called me in and he said, "Well, and he was a nice guy and he liked me." Yeah, but I was like the the, the brother <coughs> here or something. And it's just do a little bit of work, just so, so that you know the other people could see who's out of the boat. You know, you never have a problem. Just do just do something. Right? And I said, no, I, I don't I don't believe in the war. I don't believe in what we're doing here. I, I refuse to do anything. Why don't, you, why don't you send me home? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm eating your food. I'm just a waste for you. All you're doing is spending money on me, and I'm doing nothing for you. And he said, I'd love to do that. He said, but if, we, if I did that for you, he said, I have to do it for half the people in this country. I said, well, what the hell are we doing here? 